Welcome everyone to the highest rated podcast. If you check iTunes, I don't know if it's a category or not, but I'm sure it is. The highest rated podcast of, of shows by three Canadians looking at number one songs in the United States that usually are kind of bad. Although this one's not always good. good. So yeah, I, I would think that we we fit number one to that niche demographic. Listen, this is very the number specific one category. Well, that's also true. It's also the number one rated show with Brad Nelson. So there's that. So I I don't know if it's number one with Andrew Tesman, but maybe we're going to draw in some new fans today. We're going to look at a song which, to this day, every time I break out a hammer, I say this to my wife, and I make it move. I go, We don't need no education. And then she always looks at me like, I still don't know what that means. I know what it means, but did you <laughs> have to do it with that voice? And with this wrist? Well, well he was being hammer. fabulous. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't supposed to lead into you taking shots at me, but so be it. We are, pit well, Brad is pit. You met us. Yeah, uh, actually, no. Well, you've met me and yeah. I take shots at you and I take shots at Brad and Brad and I take shots at each other. So like, and we also it's just take just shots. just how it works. All right. Shot, yeah. shot, 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 shot. Okay. Oh, I, God, I hate that song. I don't know why I did that. That should be another good one to do when we sort of expand <laughs> this. But Brad picked the only song by Pink Floyd to go number one, which is a surprise and it really isn't. Pink Floyd has always been a band about the album and about the live experience. Singles was never their thing. And it, we, go ahead. They didn't want to release this as a single either. They no, didn't. and this one actually got engineered into a single from its original plan. But yeah, you're right. Pink Floyd is all about big epic stories and prog um, self-importance, I'd say. Yeah, uh, Pink Floyd's, uh, I don't know if I want to call them necessarily the king of prog rock, because, but I suppose they... I suppose they are. Actually, I, I use that as singular because when I told my dad what I was doing today, he sa I said, okay, well, wh which song are you doing? And I know he doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about. So I said, it's, it's Pink Floyd. You know them? Uh, yeah, he was this gay singer of the 70s, right? You know, so. Yes, yes, that yes. was yes. that was Pink Floyd. That By the Pink way, Floyd. which one's Pink? Bob Geldof. <laughs> well, yeah, and why, uh, oh, sorry, with, with uh, Pink, Mm -hmm. being uh, cast, or Geldof didn't want to do it at first, which I found kind of interesting, mm -hmm. uh, considering that it was it was fantastic for him. And so many people don't realize that Geldof was the guy uh, from the Boomtown Rats who sang I Don't Like Mondays, which is another great song. Very and good. then went on, of course, to do big things like uh, Live Aid and what have you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people... They, they don't equate the star of The Wall, the, the movie, um, to the Boomtown Rats and to actually the big producer who he became. I uh, tried to rewatch uh, The Wall again. I couldn't because I was sober first. Uh, <laughs> to even if I was drinking a lot. Andrew, you've seen me drunk. Uh, Brad, you've seen me drunk, not live. Uh, but I'm <laughs> generally not a miserable person when I'm under the influence. So yeah, The Wall isn't a drinking movie. The Wall is a getting high as giraffe balls movie. Which I don't do anymore. So like that really wasn't, I, I just couldn't get into it. Uh, like, or at least this time, because I haven't seen it in 20 years. And I was listening to some old, older Pink Floyd. And uh, I, I can't remember if I said this on air with you guys or off. I would love to go see Pearl Jam and and just or just anything acoustic by by Eddie Vedder, or, but I don't I shave my nipples off. Then hang out. Well, okay, but <laughs> I, I can't say that. Well, that did not happen. Oh, he, he sliced his eyebrows off in this movie. Okay, but I don't want to hang out with Eddie Vedder at all. Same with Pink Floyd. I do not want to hang out with this miserable bunch of people. They were probably, arguably, the most miserable, highly successful rock band ever. Well, mental illness ran rampant from the very beginning with Sid Barrett, who mm -hmm. uh, Roger Waters admits um, he won't ever say in interview, at least, that uh, the wall and the character of Pink was autobiographical 
Um, but he says he took from his, you know, for, for another brick in the wall part two, which is the one we're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, he took from his, um, his, uh, school experience where, you know, the teachers were only interested in, um, proving how smart they were and beating down the other kids and what have you. And basically considering that order was more important than learning. This was really, a uh almost really all Roger Waters when it, when it comes right down to it. Yes. Um, he wrote it entirely on his own and then presented yeah. it to the rest of the band who resented him for it, but decided to go along with it anyways. Well, it was a good well, move on their part. It was, it, it, it totally was. And so I was also, you probably read the same thing that I did, did, you know, a lot of it sort of was inspired by a concert in Montreal. I don't know what it is about Montreal concert crowds that just drive people insane. Uh, see roses, comma, and comma guns. <laughs> I was at that show, by the way. Oh yeah, the one where Axel stage dove and, and beat up the photographer. Uh, and recording and and uh, La Lars' hair, not Lars. Uh, James Hetfield's hair caught on fire. It was just the whole, whole thing was a colossal disaster of, of, of epic proportions. Uh, but yeah, so he he spat. Was he he was getting upset at the crowd, uh, spitting at them actually because. You're not paying attention to the music or whatever the hell it was. Yeah. Who knows? He yeah, he was annoyed that they were rocking out too hard in the front row, so he started spitting on them. Well, that's the whole thing with, with Floyd, though. It's never been like, okay, you can't put on a Floyd album and dance. I mean, honestly, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 was the closest thing to a dance track they ever had because it does have that, that sort of disco vibe in the background of it. Well, yeah, and that was added after the fact. It was, absolutely. Um, it absolutely. was a choice to go listen to some disco music and come back and add a disco feel to it. This was Bob Ezrin at his best. Yeah. Yeah, and he's, he convinced them to, to go with this, and it was, it was all right. But Floyd was never... Floyd is a band to be experienced, not to throw up the devil horns to. Mm-hmm. And so, like, here you got a guy who's miserable. I think he's just miserable in life. Still misses his friend Sid. Uh, hates his bandmates. Hates the fans, seemingly. And just really wants to put a whole wall around him. And that's really what this is. Uh, I remember this as a kid. Uh, so, like, it was a little kid. So I would have been eight when this came out. Well, we don't need no education. I didn't want to go to school. What kid, even what adult, really thinks that fondly about their school days? I sure as hell don't. You know, this uh, this song is an earlier iteration of a meme. Like, we think about memes now and the way they circulate, and they're generally images and whatnot. But mm -hmm. this really captured the, the people's imagination as a meme. Yeah, because it was so, super simple. Uh, Brad touched on the, on the riff, which was a hook, but it, it was disco influenced, but it wasn't disco. Mm -hmm. you know, this, this wasn't uh, uh, Kiss As I Was Made For Loving You. This wasn't uh, uh, Miss You By The Stones. This was something that just had a bit of a hook that seemed familiar, but maybe you didn't know why. It was not going to make the, the, the rock and roll set go, no, you sold out, man, because they didn't. Uh, I mean, well, they did concert after concert after concert, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, this guy's miserable. He's also broke as hell, as hell despite mm -hmm. having, like, and, and what, what did they say? Just like bad business decisions, uh, managers screwing them over, like. Yeah. yeah, they invested in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. So going back to the Sid thing, mm -hmm. um, when Waters uh, had, had talked about this in an interview before, he had said that Pink was based on Sid. Pink was also based on his own childhood and Pink was based on what you were saying before, Kirk, his resentment of the crowd around him. And that means the fans, that means everybody screaming in the front rows and what have you, and how he wanted to just cocoon himself away. And that's why at, I think it was the Berlin concert when the, when just after the wall had come down about eight months after, um, they had an actual set built where as they're um, playing, they, most of the wall was already built. And then they start building more and more and more and more as the concert is playing. 
and then at the end knock it down as a symbolic way of sort of reconnecting with the with the crowd with people with uh everybody in general but it wasn't the who on top of that wall daily who <laughs> calls it sorry for, for <laughs> fans. but yeah i mean like there was a lot of, of introspection going on in the creation of this album there was a lot of but i mean that's floyd's music in general you know it's it's and even in the song but you don't if you hear this as a single you don't know that i mean i think this could this song had such a great hook i thought uh so simple to sing along to this could if, if they if this was their, their first output and this was their, their only single this could have killed a band how do you mean okay because that was su- it was such a powerful song but if, if it if it was if pink floyd didn't have all this other stuff before this uh, animals mm. on dark side uh um, oh, yeah so if this was just their opening for the first time that anyone ever heard them okay what, what else are you going to sing about uh school yeah that, that's well, alice cooper did that. schools out and did okay yeah but it, yeah and also that's true i mean I'm, i i guess it's pretty well, got- same producer same yeah, producer for schools out um mm-hmm. and he's the one who um who added in the kids i think without the kids this song would have been a little bit awkward who never got paid i read it would have been because they did get paid later much much later when copyright laws changed they uh they fought for getting royalties and this song was only intended to be a filler between um oh i can't remember what the first one was and then mother uh and then it became a part a three-part song so you get this this uh originally song was going to come in at like a minute 50. And then, um, what was it, uh, the name of the producer? I just- oh, Bob Ezrin? Yeah, winds up tinkering with it, repeating a few things, adds the children's chorus, adds the disco aspect of it, and we get this. So it's, it's, it's not really a how the hell did this go to number one, it's a this shit got built to go to number one. Right, and again, just the lyrics are so simple. We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control, no dark sarcasm in the classroom. Teacher, leave them kids alone. That's it. Mm-hmm. That, that's all you need. And then you bring the kids to just sing, sing, we don't. And then teacher, leave us kids alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, without the kids, which generally, I, when, they, when they do that, it's so gimmicky. But how perfect was it for this particular thing? No, it's, the song itself is dark. It's got that disco going on in the background, but it is pretty dark like if you listen to the 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 atmosphere of the music sitting in there it's a dark song and adding the kids voices to it adds almost an ethereal quality to it like it makes it just it they almost because they're very i don't want to say monotone but there's not a lot of infl- not a lot of um note changes in that ba and that's it, you know. He sings in a modern and, style, yeah. Yeah. The whole thing is. Yeah. So with that, it it makes it gothically dark almost. Mm-hmm. And that's and then, what I think he was trying to say about the school. I think the the Gilmore's guitar solo at the end almost doesn't fit with the four to the floor disco beat, but also really ties the whole thing together in a very kind of dark, dreamy sort of way. Like it's an excellent solo. The only thing I never got as a Canadian, I'm sure Americans would feel the same way, especially when I was a kid. How are they getting pudding? I don't remember getting a lot of pudding for at school. Pudding, pudding is just dessert in British. I didn't know that. You can't it's have just dessert. Pudding. How could you eat your pudding yeah. if you hadn't eaten your meat? You can't have your dessert if you don't eat your meat. Yeah. That's all it is. It's it's just a term for dessert. I know, but it's something I didn't get. Oh, do it again. <laughs> yeah, it was it was such uh, like I, I don't think anybody could put on the wall as a young stone, you know, teenager, twenty something, whatever, and not remember the effect it had on you. This is the stuff that you sort of, like. I imagine people my brother's age, he's about eight years older than me, 
like when they when you had that on the vinyl and then you got like the giant speakers and you're just lying back and just listening to everything like mm-hmm. this was like you said earlier brad this is no mystery how this went number one uh it's i think for a lot of people who grew up later or younger than us uh you know you're listening to a bunch of stuff on class on you know classic rock and you hear floyd after floyd after floyd after floyd and this is the only song they ever had that was a monster hit mostly because they didn't release them as singles mm-hmm. well i mean even the wall was meant to be a large scale um rock opera basically mm-hmm. Not basically, exactly. It was a it was a rock opera. Yeah, but it was never it was never meant to have one single song stand alone until Ezra had at the um, the engineer or the the, uh, producing of it and created a number one song out of what the band had put together. Mm -hmm. To this day, and I don't think anyone's ever going to touch this, uh, just especially the way albums are. So, granted, we're talking about different album, but Dark Side, uh, fourteen years. On the billboard what seriously wow well, that's you know impressive that I, I don't know if it's a billboard 100 or 200 but uh broke a record that i'll just tell you because you'd never guess it uh shattered the record held by johnny mathis really yeah mathis was at for how long well i don't know i'm just just like the record it just said shattered it i, I didn't look any further okay to see how long it was but yeah pink floyd was Again, that what the this was an album band. This is not mm. a singles band. Uh, not even close to it. Uh, never will be. Uh, it, well, yeah. I mean, there's still a lot. Floyd isn't for everybody. Like I've talked to people who don't like it, and I stopped talking to them because I don't need that in my life. Um, you know, but it's it isn't for everybody. So for a psychedelic rock, a prog rock band to go number one like this is a little there's a few others, um, Genesis, but they did it in Genesis a very different wasn't. way. Yeah, Genesis was like a, the, the band they were with Peter Gabriel is not the group they became they, that gave us Susudio. Oh no, that was just a Phil solo. The fuck is Susudio mean anyway? Stupid, stupid. I think it has something to do with the name. I can't remember. Su, su, su. <laughs> Never picked that one by the way, because I did go number one. <laughs> well, now we have ideas. Yeah. Well, mm. yeah. So Pink Floyd never had another hit afterwards. Didn't matter. They still sold tons of albums. Uh, still sold, could sell out anything. If, is uh, David Gilmore still alive? So if, if they, if they, if Gilmore and uh, Roger Waters went, did, did a plan a tour together, it would sell out like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Do you know, fun fact, Roger Waters is one of the richest musicians in the world. I believe it. Hmm. I believe Good it. On. Uh, yeah. He's worth something like over $300 million. And he's probably still miserable. Probably. So if you guys could give your top three rock opera albums, and there's only, you know, you could count them on one hand if you were raised in Chernobyl. Tommy? Uh, yeah, you know, you've got... That, that sort of a thing there. So top three, Andrea. Mm, Tommy, I'm going to say chess, even though it's not really a rock opera, but it kind of is. It's a musical, but still, I'm putting it in there. Um, <laughs> Rocky Horror Picture Show. Is that a rock opera? I mean, it's a musical, but I'm putting it in there. Okay. There's no rules here. In it. There's no rules here. There's no crying in baseball, though. That is true. That is. All right, Kirk, hit it. Oof. <laughs> well, this is really this is high up there. Uh, they consider this sort of a, a concept album. I don't know if we can call it a rock opera, but uh, Mars Volta, uh, De Las and Comitarium. Uh-huh. I'm, pro- I'm, pro- I'm probably butchering up that, that album title as a, I always do. Uh, I'll, and I'm going to consider this an op- only because to me, I, it's my favorite soundtrack ever. And I know this doesn't count, but I'm doing it anyway. The Saturday Night Fever soundtrack, because I know how oh, this whole thing all plays out. That's not a rock opera. I don't care. All. That's my answer. That's just shitty disco. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have opinions on disco. Yes, yeah, I know you do. Yeah. So I got to say, Andrew, you're hundred percent right on Tommy being, being right up there. Um, Battle to hell part two. Uh, I've got a, well, battle to hell part one. Really, because I mean, yeah, that's, that's that the hell part one, not part two. Yeah, part one, and and then of course this, the wall. As far as rock operas go, I love it when a band can get a cohesive mood and package it into a into an album instead of you know trying mm-hmm. to churn out. Okay, here's here's three hits that are gonna you know chart, and here's some stuff that I wanted to say, and here's some shit that the label made me do. Pretty cool. For no, that. I would go. Potentially something even newer with um, the Black Parade, My Chemical Romance. Mm, Black did Parade, a pretty good like... job of it. As did Green Day with um, American Idiot. Yes. Jesus of Suburbia is on that album. That's a great track. Mm. What's the one that uh, Arcade Fire did? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Neighborhoods? Yeah, I think that's the one. Is that what the album's called? Uh, something, I, yeah. I think it was. That was that's a good one. I've got that one yeah. somewhere. Yeah, but when they when they're coming out with a cohesive sound for the whole album, and you have highs and lows, but it all ties together, I I think that's that's genius level songwriting. Yeah, so one that wasn't was when Kiss tried to do a rock opera. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, uh, Kiss. I've I've heard it called this once before, and I absolutely loved it. It was Kabuki Rock. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's something to it. It was, it was, it was yeah, it was a very gimmicky band, and it was one hell of a gimmick. Mm-hmm. And he is um, an even more rich man than uh, Roger Waters. Simmons is, really? Yeah, he's worth somewhere in the half a billion range. If he, can, if he can put the KISS logo on something and sell it, he will. True. There's Kiss caskets out there, but this is not about Kiss, although we'll never get to Kiss. <laughs> but don't you want to rock and roll all night and party every day? And Just part of every day. Just oh, part and part of every day. And Just part of every day. day. Part now I'm, get, I'm getting <laughs> older and I, I go to bed really early now and I, I wake up at five and I'm okay with it. You got to lay, lay, make time for a nap in there. Part of every day, not part the whole day. day. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why it's part. <laughs> uh, the, the part where I'm sober. <laughs> some days there's not much of that part the part where you're sleeping then well there's that <laughs> so since you keep coming up with great songs i have to bring this back to what this is really all oh about. are we getting into the nitty shitty oh yes <sighs> you know when i was a kid i had lego and i would build little things with a le- with my lego but i never built a city on rock and roll. This was not, this was not a bad song. This, this was a bad de-evolution of a good band. And I won't want to say too much. <laughs> okay. I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave Brad you has some nugget. opinions. I'll leave you with this nugget. This song is so bad that one of the singers con- continuously apologizes for it. That would be Miss Slick. That would be Miss Slick. <laughs> no, no, no. I was actually introduced to, to um, Starship as Starship, and then I discovered uh, Jefferson Airplane before or after that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, the, the, the tragedy of this. But with that being said, hey, do you know what I did? I wrote a book. Why? No, you didn't write a book. I did write a book. You can buy it. It's about Chavo Guerrero, the late, great Chavo Guerrero. It's Andrew's favorite wrestling book, isn't it? It is, 100%. Absolutely. I helped him write that before he passed away. Chavo Guerrero, instant classic. Get that on Amazon.com. Hey, I do a bunch of other shows. It's not always with these two. Chris Bourdain and I uh, are up now is our look at that 80 show. Andrea is going to be a special guest on the next one, where we're looking at the 1989 Oscars. Well, the Oscars were a little bit interesting, weren't they? From the last one. They they were. Mm-hmm. Well, this the one slap was... heard around the world. Yes, it was. And because I told you guys, I told you, it drives you insane. But anyway, moving on. Every week I, I have the Hall of Fame show with Evan Nolan. We talk about Halls of Fame because you know it's not Hall of Fame.com. That's kind of what we do. Also, Vinny Las Penuso does a show with me. He makes the Hall of Fame case for really strange people. Sometimes I've usually never even heard of this, some of these people he comes up with, but 
hey, why not? And the Classic Sports Review is back. Glenn Pulowski, the greatest, art, no, actually the greatest triathlete ever to come out from Buffalo and now Antarctica's current champion of the triathlon. We looked at the first ever game of the USFL in 1983. And my God, uh, the use of the word gorilla was used. Maybe that's uh, something they could have edited it out at some point in time. But, well, they weren't as PC then. And they really like to ogle these cheerleaders. All look like my Aunt Kim. It's not really a compliment. But anyway, wherever you are, wherever you may be. <laughs> hey, you know, I don't, you know, I was asking my dad the other day, what do you think she really looks like? Because we've never really seen her without like, two tons of makeup on. Well, she's not going to watch. So that's true. That's you know, true. Kirk, if I could read, your book would be my favorite wrestling book, too. <laughs> that's why Brad listens to podcasts. <laughs> I happen to have a, quite a few of them. So wherever you are, wherever you may be, stay safe, everyone. Good night. <laughs>